Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. My name's Will Trugonning. Can we thank Wayne who has... Thank you. So, um, I didn't expect everyone to stop talking so quietly. I was going to invite you to talk to one another, uh, to introduce yourself to people in the aisle. Maybe you can do that later and now that we've started, let's just keep going. How are you tonight? That's good. It's good to see you. What, what are you guys on tonight? <laughs> Everyone at Uniting just thought, what? <laughs> anyway, it's a trick question. You're on Aboriginal land, of course. And so I want to start by paying respects to Aboriginal people and the elders past, present and future. It's um, Reconciliation Week last week and NIDOC week coming up in July. Because of her, we can. So a special shout out to the grandmas and aunties. Because of them, we can stop another stolen generation. And in saying that, I guess I'm acknowledging that acknowledgement is not enough. It's never enough, is it? The criminalization of drug use isn't wrong just because it's racist, but it is racist in the way that it's applied. And a Yora person working, walking on country tonight would be much more likely to be stopped and searched for illegal drugs than I would even though I would be much more likely to be carrying them. I'm not. I haven't had any illegal drugs since yesterday. Racism is, is the history of the criminalization of drug use. The whole health thing, that's just the wave of gentrification that came later. And I've seen that myself over the last 10 years, living in King's Cross, as the juice bars and gyms have pushed the problems that people aren't really prepared to solve elsewhere. One day I came across an Aboriginal man in my neighbourhood. He was resting outside McDonald's on the ground and in front of him in a fan were all his possessions. Standing over him were two white police officers going through all of his stuff, trying to find drugs. And as I walked past, what really struck me was that me and all the people streaming past, all the business people in suits and whatnot, had more than likely committed exactly the same offence that that man was being searched for. And at that moment, I just had to stand there and bear witness. And what struck me was the expression on his face, this look of utter resignation in that moment. Now, I was brought up in the Catholic tradition. I cannot profess to be an expert on matters religious, but we are in a church tonight. And when you look at Jesus up here, he's a little hard to see in this light, but when you look at Jesus up here, he looks kind of nice, right? He looks, he looks uh, like he's having a pretty good time, but in, in the Catholic church, of course, he's much more likely on the cross, and he looks up towards heaven on the cross with that look of resignation. And what struck me on seeing that man was this was the thing that I'd been taught in school. The face of the vulnerable is the face of God. And that, that was something that I couldn't walk past. We're in a church tonight. Did you notice that? You did. A lot of people have been to church lately that wedding a few weeks back. And how about that sermon, right? It was a little long, perhaps, but it had a really important message at the core, a message from uh, Martin Luther King. Essentially, from within Windsor Castle, that was a call to restructure our society on the basis of love. And that's how I like to think about what we're doing here tonight. So thank you for coming to be part of that. <coughs> Unharm's an organisation working to change the way society relates to drugs and people who use drugs. Because the reality is, is that in every culture, people have and do and will continue to use drugs. For heaven's sake, even many animals use substances to change their perception. So our ambition is to make that as positive, ethical and safe as can be. We promote fairness for, between, and by people who use drugs, whatever those drugs might be. My name is Will Trugonning. I'm a founder of Unharm, and I'm an organizer in the movement. 
What's really exciting for me tonight is that we're bringing different groups together for the first time. It's been brilliant to work with Uniting on the organization of this event, and thanks for turning out tonight. To, um, tonight we're, trying to, we're, we're working to find common ground. It's an opportunity to learn, to be inspired, and to energize the movement to end the criminalization of drug use. Looking around tonight, I see a lot of people who have been working hard in the movement. And I see a lot of new faces too. Thank you for coming along. And I see a lot of people. Look at us now. Now to, to kick us off and to introduce us from, uh, on, on behalf of Uniting, I'd like to introduce two people to you. Reverend Ken Day, to welcome us to his church and Doug Taylor from Uniting to welcome us on behalf of Uniting. Would you like to come up? Thank you. I welcome you here this evening to St. Stephen's, which is on Gadigal land, and we gather on their land week by week and day by day here. We are so glad you can be part of St. Stephen's Uniting's life and the elders and myself greet you and very glad you can be here. Apologies from our moderator, Simon, who cannot be here this evening, and I bring his greetings as well. So everyone, you are most welcome here tonight. Feel at home and relax. Thanks very much, Ken, and uh, thank you, Will, and our friends at uh, Unharm for inviting us to be part of this event. We're, we're honoured to be part of it. Um, Unharm do fantastic, uh, impressive work in the field of harm reduction and drug law reform advocacy. We're proud to be working with them and we encourage all of you uh, to support them in their campaign work. For us at the Uniting Church, we're inspired by Christ's vision of a world that's inclusive, that's just and connected. This is why our church was the first, as we understand it, the first church in the world to pass a resolution last year to campaign for the decriminalisation of drugs in small quantities and to advocate for greater investment into treatment and harm reduction services. We've come to this point because every day we see the adverse effects of criminalisation through Uniting's Medically Supervised Injecting Centre in King's Cross. We're heartened that through this work, over 13,000 referrals have been made into treatment with not a single death. However, there is still, yes, absolutely. <laughs> However, as many of you would appreciate, there is still more work to do. And we see this issue as a matter of social justice. The criminalization of small quantities of drug use creates unnecessary stigmatisation and social isolation for drug users and creates compounding disadvantage for vulnerable groups of people who often have high use of drugs use, drug use. Further to this, the church has always sought to take stand on matters of common sense when evidence tells us that things are not working. To that end, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Peter Warland our outgoing executive director at Uniting, uh, for, and thank him for his leadership on this, on this issue within our church. Thanks very much, Peter. <laughs> and finally, uh, welcome to Manuel. Uh, what you've done in, in Portugal is pioneering and has saved many lives. Uh, the response, the fantastic response tonight is a sign, we hope, that things are changing. And we're looking forward to learning uh, from you tonight and understanding how we might apply these learnings in Australia. Thank you very much. And, and back to you, Will. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. Now, just before I invite Manuel to come up, I do just want to say thank you and welcome to our viewers on Facebook Live tonight. We've got a huge room here packed with people. We've also got a lot of people watching. Uh, from around the country, who knows, maybe around the world. A special shout out to the staff of the Sydney MC, whom I understand are watching right now, as well as to the uh, amazing crew in Melbourne, SSDP and the Unharm organizers down there. Hello. <laughs> now, of course, you know what we're here for tonight. Manuel Cardoso, uh, Dr. Manuel Cardoso is a medical doctor and a public health consultant. 
and the Deputy Director of the Intervention on Addictive Behaviours and Dependencies General Directorate, which has the much more wieldy acronym SICAD. Manuel, please join me on stage. Thanks so much for um, your generosity, Manuel. It's been extraordinary. I think we've probably asked uh, Manuel to do about a thousand things while he's here, and I think you've said yes to just about all of them, which is incredibly generous, so thank you. We really appreciate it. it it's an amazing opportunity, I think, to learn, and, and as I said before, to energize the movement here. So I'm going to ask Manuel some questions as we explore the experience in Portugal uh, of reform before and since 2001. The way it's going to work is that then I'm going to invite our two other guests tonight up on stage uh, later in the to join the conversation. Um, Jeff Gallup, former Premier of Western Australia, and Dr. Marianne Johnsey, the Director of the uh, Sydney Medically Supervised Injecting Centre. Once we've heard from both of them, there will also be an opportunity to ask questions. Um, there will be, I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on, but the mic position, there's just one microphone, so you'll have to form an orderly queue. Be ready for that, we'll get to that later on. So Manuel, thanks so much for being here tonight. I think perhaps could you tell us from the, from the big story perhaps first, what exactly changed in 2001? What we hear the most about was decriminalization of the use of drugs, but it wasn't just that, was it? Of course not. Uh, let me first uh, uh, thank you to the invitation and uh, first of all, uh, thanks to Neida um, um, to inviting me to, to come to the conference, to Neida conference, thanks to Larry and, uh, and Susie to invite me. Of course, uh, the criminalization was uh, a framework, is a framework, is a process also. It's not, it's not uh, to us, it's not the solution because we have to do many things around this. But what really happened, it, uh, it's that uh, decriminal decriminalizing uh, the possession and consumption of drugs allows us to do everything else in all areas. To help people you, who use drugs, it's no longer a crime to us, because it's not only to use drugs that was a crime. Helping these people was a crime too. So it seems that the paradox to uh, give treatment, help people uh, with, with uh, changing syringes or, or needles to, um, to commit crime. We look at people like a people that people who, ne who needs uh, help we need that are sick, sick people, uh, drug addictions as a disease, and they need treatment, they need help. At that time, uh, the government, and I have to say that the, the, the Prime Minister at that time was uh, Antonio Guterres, the, the current uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, and what they found uh, was that, that the um, decriminalizing was within the conventions. Uh, and, and that's why uh, also we decriminalize, they discuss decriminalize, legalize, or depenalize, uh, something like that. And they could help us to um, decide or help the commission, that, that commission to decide. And that that uh, is the reason I, 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 I see you, you, you want to make another question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so interested. I think everyone is too. So one of the things that's really interesting in there is that um, there are many things. One yeah. of them is that government, uh, am I right in understanding that both sides of government agreed to allow the commission to make recommendations? How did that come about? I mean, I think that's for Australians, given the current political climate, it's hard to imagine both sides of parliament allowing a commission to make 
decisions. What not the commission don't make a decision. Uh -huh. The commission make a proposal, make a report. Okay. What what the government uh, do, uh, did at that time was to nominate a, a, a commission with um, experts on the area, lawyers and uh, psychologists, uh, uh, medical doctors, uh, psychiatrists, uh, and so. And then I think it's it's amazing because they invited a researcher that comes from the United States, know nothing about drugs, to to, to lead the group. We uh, we had a, a fantastic report. It's so uh, a good report that the government took it like it is to make the strategy. Mm -hmm. It changed some some points of something, but nothing important and the only uh, request the government put to the commission was within the, the the limits of the conventions nothing more and what were some of the other important proposals that the committee made uh, in that report beyond decriminalization of personal possession of drugs i think it's a comprehensive approach first of all Look at the principles. We have eight principles. I only mentioned two, humanism and pragmatism. Humanism saying that even the, the, the drug addicts, the user of drugs is a person with human rights uh, like the other people. You have the same rights and we have the same, uh, the same uh, obligation to help them to be a full people in, in uh, our rights. The other principle is the pragmatism. And the pragmatism only to say something like that. You take the measures that will be needed to help people, not that uh, other thing, not with preconceived uh, 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 ideas or something like that. But look, identify the problem, try to solve the problem. What you need, you take it and, and solve the problem. That's its pragmatism, not uh, without any preconceived ideas or because they are black, uh, white, and, or religious or not religious, not matter. People are people, they need help and you help them. That sounds good. I mean, I love the sound of that too. I don't know about anyone else here tonight, but the thing that drives me crazy is that as a person who uses prohibited substances, I'm excluded from participation in solving problems. So when our Australian politicians talk about community responses, they exclude people who use drugs as if we have nothing. You know, they maintain that barrier between people who use one set of drugs and people who use the legal drugs. Only the people who use legal drugs are allowed to be part of the solution. Let's not get onto my views, though. Too far. <laughs> in this moment in the late 1990s, emerging from um, the dictatorship, which I think ended in the 1970s, Portuguese, the economy wasn't so great, and in this moment of economic downturn, everyone turned to heroin. Uh, before that, maybe... Not everyone, but, sorry. But, uh, you know. No, yeah, I, I'm not everyone. <laughs> Drug addiction was... A, a, a problem felt by everyone. When we start uh, treating people, if I, 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 at the beginning in 1998, I tried to understand how much that people who are in treatment spend consuming drugs. And what I found was something like 384 million euros they spend each year something like that to uh, uh, to uh, buying drugs for consumption yeah i mean if you're wondering what the australian drug you know what australians spend on drugs the last estimate from 2010 was about seven and a half billion dollars someone's going to catch me out on that i know but anyway it's in that order so that, and that is i think widely um viewed to be an underestimate. So seven and a half billion dollars and most of that is profit, about six billion is profit. So yeah, I mean, what is interesting also is that in Australia, I think the uh, rate of the use of illegal drugs is about, about three times Portugal. About 5% of Portuguese use a prohibited substance each 
year, am I right in recalling yeah, that? Yeah, we have uh, the... Lucky the we've got 12, lots of 12, academics in the audience. <laughs> yes, in the, in the 12 months before the, the survey, 5.4% uh, uh, of people said they use cannabis. Okay. Any, any drug, not only cannabis, any okay. drug. Heroin, cocaine, and the other, other drugs are the decreasing the consumption. Uh, only cannabis uh, have an increase, uh, not, not so small, because we had uh, less uh, numbers uh, before that. Uh, but we really had a problem, economic problem, in the last uh, five or six years. And the last, uh, the last survey, the, the, the survey before the, the last one in 2012, we are in the middle. Thank you. And stepping back, when you were talking us through the strategy before, could you talk a little bit about what it, what it looks like on the ground? So if we, there's the strategic documents and you've described those beautifully for us. In terms of what's different now in terms of services or what happens within communities, what's different now in comparison well, with yeah, before what, 2001? Okay, we create this uh, network of treatment. We create a, treat, a, a network on arm reduction, including these, uh, these uh, structural uh, measures I, I mentioned, the, the plan to... Um, national plan to integrate with responses. Uh, so we have a, a lots of uh, work in all the areas, including dissuasion. Uh, and this network um, is working in all the country. Uh, we have uh, uh, facilities, uh, units, all over the country. You know, maybe we could move on just to talk about how some particular groups within Portuguese society responded to the, to the reforms. One of them that I think comes to mind for most Australians is the police. Now, police are very internally divided. There are plenty of police who would support ending criminalisation of drug use. But let's just say that we would also be curious, uh, as former convicts, Sorry, Australian joke. To know um, how did police respond, or were they involved? Did they help even contribute to the process of reform? Okay, first, I think the the, the police, uh, when uh, when the process is criminalizing, uh, at the first moment or the first times, the police send the the the, the consumers to to the court. This is not a solution. And I, I heard many times, including police saying that sending some uh, user, drug user, to prison is to send them to a school of crime. If they are not a crime, send them to prison. Is if in the first moment, when they saw someone consuming they, they thought two times what I go to do. Catch them or uh, uh, talk to them, send to court, or it's a big problem. I have to, 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 to write a great report for nothing. I look to the other side. So they don't care of that people. Could you perhaps just, um, we'll, we'll get Jeff Gow up in a moment to talk a little about, bit about his experience in Western Australia, but before we do that, could you talk, tell us a little bit about what's coming up, like, are there things, that, is there work that remains to be done? Do you have aspirations beyond the current system? I mean, um, tell us what you're allowed to say, you know, <laughs> in a public forum. But um, I'd just be interested to hear, you know, are, are there things that you think could be better about the system? I look at the, the, the good and that I try to solve the, the bad things or things are not so good. So I always look at that part. And looking at that, what we can do or what we, uh, I can say is that we made things that uh, were, uh, were needed to be made, in fact. Nowadays, we have to, to be aware 
of some kind of drugs that like fentanyl that is coming from to United States to Canada and a small amount in Europe and is so uh, problematic uh, that we need to be aware and, and prepared. If something comes, we have to be prepared to, to, to deal with the problem uh, in a moment, uh, uh, quickly. In this, this moment, what happens is, as I said before, if it, this is not a problem, for the society, uh, what happened is uh, the investment in the area is uh, going down. So maybe it's the only problem I can find. Okay, yeah. And what about in other countries, European countries? I mean, there's been some suggestion that Norway will take steps, for example, towards a similar sort of reform to Portugal. Are there are there other countries in, in, in Europe or elsewhere that you're hopeful about or that you, that, you know, are, are you asked to go and speak when the Norwegian parliament says, oh, let's think about decriminalization? Is there a transfer of ideas within the EU? Yeah, we discuss uh, with, uh, we don't discuss. People come to us uh, to ask for our experience like, like we did, you did uh, here, uh, but in fact, we did the work without thinking about uh, having this kind of uh, audience. We, we, we took the work to really help our people. And we did it. The, the, the best way we, we had at the time, we have at the moment. And some, some guy from the from, uh, United States look at us and say, that's a good practice and uh, they have so good results and put us in the, in the, uh, to be the discussing Cato around the world. The and Cato in Institute? Fact, Is this, are you referring to the Cato Institute? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and after that, uh, we have, uh, Everyone. yeah, <laughs> asking, asking for us. We, Thank you, Manuel. That was fantastic. Thanks for, the, um, for, for that initial introduction. There will be time for more. Let's get an Australian perspective. We're lucky enough to have uh, Jeff Gallup, who's an emeritus professor at the University of Sydney. He's also, Jeff, do join us on stage. As you do that, I'm going to get, here he comes. Thank you. Um, while, while I'm welcoming you, I'm going to organize Mary Ann's chair because she's going to be joining us up here soon too. Now, one of the reasons that we particularly wanted to have Jeff join us this evening is that when he was the Premier of Western Australia, his government decriminalized the possession of cannabis. I think, if I understand correctly, could you explain what, what, what exactly was the reform? Uh, the reform really was based upon the principle that those who were apprehended with small amounts of cannabis for their personal use would not be subject to the criminal regime. Uh, and a system of fines was put into place and also uh, reference to, if it was necessary, reference to uh, uh, services that, that could assist the individual. So it was a classic decriminalisation of personal use uh, of one particular drug, that being cannabis. The previous government was edging into the reform territory when they introduced a caution system for first time uh, offenders. And so there was a sense in which there was a little bit of movement uh, in the political frame, but uh, my party in opposition was looking for new ideas, was taking consultations. And I make this point, it's very important to have people in the community who take an interest in a subject in the civil society gather the evidence and knock on the door of the politicians. And uh, in this case, it had an impact. Uh, my caucus was very keen to do different things. We actually put a policy before the people in the 2001 election. Uh, we then had a drug summit uh, to look at what a representative group of Western Australians, 80 of whom were applied to attend the summit, 20 of whom came from the, the different service providers and interest groups in society. Uh, they confirmed that the view that we were taking was correct, that we needed to change. 
in a moderate way. It wasn't a huge change. Uh, and that gave us a lot of authority. One, we didn't conceal our policies before the election. We put them up front. We won the election. Then we had them confirmed with a, a, a summit of ordinary people considering these matters. And that gave us enormous authority when we, the Attorney General and the Health Minister went into the Parliament. Upper House a little bit more difficult, but by two votes uh, the reform went through uh, the Parliament. So I think i just like to emphasise that having people in the community with an interest in the subject, who gather the evidence, who knock on the door and say, look, there's a better way to do things, uh, is very important if there's going to be reform. So who were those people? I'm curious now. Tell us a little bit more about that process, that process where um, people presumably began to engage with you. Well, we, we, we sent out a signal, you know, to the policy community, I guess, generally in opposition, that we were keen uh, to develop new ideas. In fact, we went into the election with very clear policies on a whole range of issues. And we invited academics and interest groups in to talk to us about how the world works and how you might make it a little bit better. We put out papers uh, that weren't necessarily going to be the policy in the election, but gave the community an idea of where, where we were going. We did that in the drugs field, so we put out a, a, a statement that this is where we think we'll go for the election. And, you know, I, I think that the, the, the evidence that we got from academics and others was that, yes, if we're talking about human beings, as, as Manuel said very well, people, just like the rest of us, but they happen to, to use cannabis in this case, uh, their, their rights, their future, their dignity as people were being affected by the current regime. But more importantly also, the, and this is probably more the Portuguese example, but it's very hard to implement a good system related to health issues if there's the criminal underlay to that system. And I think that was a very strong bit of evidence we got, particularly from academics, that if you want to deal with the health issue, this criminal thing really makes it difficult. There's the stigma, there's the secrecy and all that sort of thing that goes with it. So very important to have groups in the community uh, knocking on the doors of the, of the politicians. And in, in our case, we were receptive, went into the upper house, the, the, the Green members lined up with the Labor members and, and we got it through by two votes. Fantastic. And just noting for everyone that um, I liked your point about making it clear in advance of the election what your policy would be. You might or might not know, but the current West Australian Labor government also put it in their elect election platform to decriminalise cannabis. So let's Can I make a point on that? <laughs> yes, please it's, it's do. It's interesting that the one thing that we didn't do that is necessary in the longer term and for the more substantive issues is get bipartisan support. And I think we could compare the aid strategy from an earlier time in Australian history where there was a lot of cooperation across the, uh, the borders of politics, locked in a strategy that made Australia a leader in that field. Unfortunately, uh, the, the opposition in Western Australia did not support our strategy. Uh, some of them might have, but certainly they lined up against it. And quite, I mean, this was a big thing for them. The day before the 2005 election, re-election of my government, they had big ads in the paper that, you know, uh, all babies in the cot will be smoking a, a joint, you know, or something. And uh, didn't impact on the electorate at all. But the tragedy is, because the opposition are not part of the team, when they did win the election, they've... they've fairly significantly reversed uh, what we were trying to do. So, you know, we've got to get both sides on, 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 onto the same page with this issue. Otherwise, you don't lock it in. And that, that I think, is a failure uh, of, of some policy. And how was the reform, that reform, greeted by other, you know, powerful groups, for example, by media at the time? Well, the, 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 the media uh, obviously were keen to, to sensationalise some aspects of the issue. But I think because we had... We'd been very upfront. We also had the drug summit where ordinary people are voting, very clear as they did here in New South Wales, voting for change. That also impacted on the media. So I, I don't think the media uh, were in any sense a negative force on this. I think they allowed our arguments to come up. They obviously gave room for the opponents of the system as well. But I think never underestimate what I might call due process in decision making. It's when you try and play tricks that you know the media really get hot, you know, and they, they come in to try and knock you off. If if you follow a process, I think it helps. 
May, may I? Please uh, do. Uh, mention only uh, when we talk about media, um, many times media don't take uh, position, but the way they talk about the issue is important mm -hmm. and, and pass messages. So what we did um, was to take journalists and training them to understand what we are doing mm -hmm. and to understand the, the, the message and the, the, the words at the moment. They used to say that means lots of doses in the street and means some lot of millions of mm -hmm. euros. And that's it. something that people look, some people want to to Manuel, to can you send some of those Catholic bishops over here to Australia? Because <laughs> they, they, the church did act as a negative force uh, throughout the debate in Western Australia for reasons that I can't quite understand. Sections of the, the Christian church are very hostile towards all aspects of, of drug law reform and in a sense represented the, the opposition yeah. you know, to what we were doing. But uh, their, their uh, parishioners, on the other hand, I think, didn't quite agree with them and, you know, th they yeah. supported. Police were also on side with, with reform. Um, one, we were the government of the day and, and, and so we can set the agenda. But also I think they felt that policing, there's lots of complications around policing these days. The hierarchy of the police service were very keen to, to be uh, part of the community, enforcing the law, but also uh, in ways that don't undermine their position in society. And I think apprehending young, you know, drug users is not exactly improving their reputation in, in sections. And so the police were very, really quite supportive of what we were doing. Yeah. And Manuel, reflecting on what Jeff was talking about, about the role of civil society in bringing about the reform in Western Australia, was there a similar role for non-government groups in interacting with government around the reform process in Portugal? Uh, if I remember well, no. Uh -huh. you, don't, you don't have a, a civil society, a, a strong uh, civil society asking, asking for. We feel um, that uh, really in the, the community uh, felt the problem and are supportive but uh, we didn't have um, main organizations or so asking, uh, asking for that. Right. We might, um, let's, let's bring our third guest up here this evening. Dr. Marianne Johnsey is the medical director. Please welcome Dr. Johnsey. Marianne is the medical director of the Sydney Medically Supervised Injecting Centre and someone whom I've had the pleasure of working with uh, in the movement for some years now. Um, you know, one of the things that's unique in Australia about the injecting centre is, of course, that it's the, the, the one piece of Australian territory where it's not, a, not an offence to use a pro prohibited substance. What kind of atmosphere does that create in MSIC? And what, what you know... Um, Manuel and Jeff have both talked about what, what is enabled by taking the criminal dimension out of drug use. What have you observed in your time at the injecting centre? You know, the reality is it would be nice to say there's some amazing, you know, inspirational difference or some kind of, you know, the, it all becomes clear. But, of course, the reality is they're the same people that we see on the streets. They're the same people that we rub shoulders with and go to the coals down the street with. They look the same, they're doing the same thing, but they have a sense of agency and a sense of citizenship and a sense of belonging just a bit more mm -hmm. where, where we are. And there's an awful lot of good health services where people are treated with dignity and respect. But the difference is even when you treat someone with dignity and respect, and as we know in you know the 8,000 places around New South Wales where we provide clean injecting equipment and where we've been doing that for 30 years, you know, then we have to watch them when they go into the toilet because at that point they might be doing something illegal. So there is an acceptance 
an, a reality, an acknowledgement, a pragmatism that you were talking about, Manuel, that is allowed to exist where we are because in other health services we can talk about people's drug use um, and we can provide them the syringes, but then we must tell them to go away. So there, there is, and maybe it's small, but there is just a, a slightly different feel that is an acceptance and where people really feel that this is, this is their space. This is their space. And what about the less happy side, I guess, outside of the MSIC? I mean, um, my observation is that the experience of criminalisation of drug use for people who are MSIC clients on the streets of King's Cross is very different, for example, from my experience. I've never been searched on the streets of the cross, but that's not necessarily the case for your clients, if I understand well, I don't correctly. Know. What's I, it like? I, I, I'm not sure if you've realised, but there's one or two people watching you, Will, so maybe tomorrow you will be searched on the streets of King's Cross. <laughs> we'll wait and see, will we? Um, the reality is, is, is absolutely right. And what we see and what we know is that people who are on the margins of society, who are already stigmatised and discriminated against, are the people that do badly. And they are often the people we see. So I know that 50% of the people that come to use our service have a history of prison. And probably more than that, have a history of some kind of arrest and charges and, and why is that? It's because we fill up our jails with people committing crimes in order to buy the drugs to fuel the habit. Um, and you began by talking about the inherent racism that started um, the approach to drugs. And I think, you know, if we're talking about the war on drugs, you know, somebody put it to me the other day, we need to declare peace. We need to declare peace because that's what's going to make a difference and level the playing field. Thank you. And what do you what do you see in society? Like, what what if we were to extend this model of decriminalisation beyond the walls, those walls of the MSIC, to the whole state, for example? What can you envisage would change? I guess the first first thing to say is that. <sighs> You know, the sky wouldn't fall in. I, I, I think really, you know, there will be there will be benefits. A lot of those will be about just being able to change the narrative, being able to change, reframe what's going on, um, change the way we talk about people who use drugs and, and go to the heart of what both of you have spoken about, which is about the citizens of our country and our fellow human beings and the people that you're sitting beside in the church tonight. You know, in the conversations that we've started to have when we're talking about systems change and, you know, people are so focused on if you decriminalise drug use, what does the evidence show about the prevalence rates and new incidence rates and recent use and last, you know, ever use? And, you know, to me, I think the thing I've realised is it's not so much about the drugs. It's about people. It's about the way we treat people. It's about the type of society we want to live in. And at the end of the day, you know, speaking to somebody, you know, pretty senior today when... I said, but think about it. If police stop and search someone you care about, what do you want to happen? In Portugal, um, they are not criminalised and they are sent somewhere where if they have a problem, they are then sent on for further treatment. If they don't have a problem, then something different happens. And the response was, yes, but we have that, we have that capacity to do that here. Police have discretion. Not in New South Wales, they don't. Not for, you know, if you find somebody with heroin, the police don't have the option to send them to treatment in New South Wales. In fact, when we talk about drug courts here, what does that mean? Somebody has actually have got a, committed a crime, a robbery, a bag snatch, a, you know, a car theft, and then a drug court will allow them, if they've committed a non-violent offence, to get diverted into treatment. That sounds okay. Isn't it better that we get treatment? We're talking about, you know, drug-related crime and we don't want to fill up our prisons. But you know what? Why did they have to commit the robbery for the police to refer them into treatment or the courts to get them into treatment? Shouldn't that be the starting point? 
Shouldn't that be where we start? And uh, indeed it should. Marianne, you're like um, a few people here tonight, someone who, who, who's been working pretty hard trying to make change happen lately. How, how, how's your experience been? We spend a lot of time together sitting in rooms trying to strategize about, about, about how to build the movement. This year, to me, it's felt really exciting. It feels like there's something new, there's an energy. How, how's your year been so far? Do you feel that? Are you hopeful? What do you see ahead? I see quite a few people ahead. Well, I don't know how many pews back here. I'm sure somebody's counting. I think, personally, as a female, um, I think we need to authorise our own leadership a little bit more, if I can be honest about myself. I, you know, that line about, you know, don't ever underestimate the power of a few individuals to change the world because that's all it ever has. I think, you know, it's easy to sort of be a little bit defeatist and I wonder perhaps within our field if we've gotten a bit to the point of going, yeah, yeah, it's, it's never going to change. And then actually you have to say to yourself, but what have you done? And how many letters to politicians have I written in the last 12 months? And how many times have I tried to have a meeting with the minister? And how many times have, you know, I tried to organise a church event? And then you think, okay, well, let's, let's try. And crikey, you know, then you do stuff. And it's, so that's what's exciting, I think, is this sense of if we can authorise ourselves to be the change we want to see, the really scary thing is then the change actually starts to happen. And so that's, I think, what I feel really personally excited about mm -hmm. is just a sense of, well, geez, let's just do it. Mm -hmm. Let's just do it because, gosh, then we might actually do it. No, I don't think we might. We will, no doubt. Would, at this point, I'd like to invite questions from the audience um, and open up the discussion. Now, we have just the one microphone, which is right down the front here. I'm afraid you are going to have to stand up and walk down the front. You see this one on the stand? If there's someone immediately in the front row, you can borrow mine as well. Just let me know. Uh, hi, uh, my name's Adam Joseph. Uh, I've, I first came to the MSIC as a political advisor, God, back in um, many, many, many years ago. Uh, I worked for a conservative liberal, uh, and I've worked mostly for Libs and Nats over that period of time. I, I got to know Marianne Jauncey uh, very well since working the preventative health portfolio uh, in the O'Farrell government. Uh, it, it strikes me that uh, conservative people who actually engage, who actually take the time to visit, they realise that it's actually common sense. Um, how do we ensure that they all engage? You're, you're the expert on bipartisanship, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I think there's a, there's a distinction we, we could make here between being conservative in terms of your overall political positioning and being conservative in the way that you bring about change. And I think one of the lessons in this field, and it, it does make the Portuguese type experiment a bit difficult in Australia, is that you know, when opportunities emerge in specific contexts, you know, change does happen. Uh, and uh, usually it's, it's modified, it's, it's, it's moderated. So the other point of view gets a bit of an edge in and perhaps compromises the legislation a bit or, or whatever. Uh, so I think conservatism, as a view that we should proceed carefully and, and cautiously is quite a good principle uh, in, in all government. We should be careful and to try to make sure that the consequences that come out of something are unintended and negative. So in that sense, conservatism should be quite happy with bringing about change. But on the other side, I think where the conservative is, 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 a, is a specific political philosophy, which is based upon the principle that those who use drugs are in some sense not just sinful but criminal, uh, you know, that does represent, I think, a real challenge for, for reformers. So conservatism shouldn't be an issue, as we saw with the AIDS thing. You know, the Swiss are fascinating, the Dutch are fascinating. Here's a problem, let's solve it. You know, the Portuguese, here's a problem. Pragmatism and conservatism, in a sense, are very closely related. But as a radical form of ideology, it does represent a difficulty 
for those of us who do want to bring about change? No. I think perhaps the microphone on the stand is presenting a difficulty for people who might want to ask a question. So I'm just going to walk around and if, oh, please. Um, that was all it took. Uh, my name's Michaela. I work with uh, teenagers and adolescents and a lot of them have drug problems starting from a really young age, sort of 12, 13. And almost all of them also have accompanying mental health issues. And we see that all the way through the adults that I work with as well. And it's really hard to find a service that will handle both the drug side of things and the mental health side of things. There's a lot of passing the buck. And there's almost no services out there for teenagers and adolescents. So I was wondering how Portugal has, has managed the dual diagnosis situation of the combination of um, drugs and mental health? Uh, nowadays we have another program, we call it a long-term program, because these people are so difficult to uh, reintegrate in the society that they need support for more time than one or two uh, year, so this program is uh, about three years with another year of uh, possibility that depends on the, on the needs. Thank you. Marion, did you want to comment on that? No? No, okay. Thank you so much for your uh, you know, words of wisdom tonight. Um, my name is Ellie Howes. I'm actually one of the candidates running in the New South Wales election next year. I'm the Labor candidate for Balmain. And you know, I'd just like to say that I fully support the principles of unharm. Uh, and I would love to see this uh, taken up in the future by whoever wins government next year. Um, I can hope and pray and, w and do my best. W the one thing I wanted to ask was, how do we get the evidence and the experience of places like Portugal into good public policy making and into actually changing our laws and going through legislative reform? Because there's there are some really major barriers there, I think, that we've got in this state. And I'd love to hear, you know, your ideas of how we can convince the people on the other side of the road there um, that this is, these are really important reforms that we need to pursue based on the evidence and the experience of places like Portugal. Oh, come on, don't look at me. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to take the question, but um, it's to me. I'm just the interviewer. I mean, to me, the thing is that we cannot tell people the evidence, the evidence, the evidence. That's the end of the discussion. You have to create identification and tell compelling stories that connect with people's values. And at that point, they're ready. That's when you can only as a supporting tool, you know, and also as a matter of accountability, provide the evidence. Uh, but perhaps one of the biggest problems has been that idea within this particular policy community that if, you know, we just get people to understand, then things will change. Uh, that is well, not what how about, humans work. Uh, I think the lesson from New South Wales with the injecting centre is the, the drug summit played a key role. If you look at Irish politics over the last three years, the Assembly randomly selected two-thirds, one-third from the parliament to look at abortion on the one side and uh, marriage equality on the other. Uh, the authority that's given to a policy that emerges from ordinary people thinking about an issue and not being asked to respond in a, an opinion poll, but thinking about an issue, they're very positive results. So I think if we could encourage our parliamentary um, class here in New South Wales to have some sort of an assembly dealing with what is a tricky issue, but one that I think there is reason in, in what Manuel said. There is reason, there's evidence, but I think yeah. to have the authority of the people helps enormously. Yeah. We are moving, maybe slowly, but uh, the, the, the people uh, can be aware of the, the problem. And that's it's the kind of the re one uh, one uh, movement you can you you can make is keep people aware of the problem, and if you do this, things change for sure. Thank you. No, I'm, I'm aware that um, right. Marion is going to come up. I just it starts with a conversation. Evidence on its own is never 
enough. You need to have the evidence, but it is never on its own enough unless you have a, a, a narrative that goes with it and the stories behind it to make it connect with an individual and make it seem real. We are social creatures, we need stories, that's how we engage, respond, react and feel things and then we'll be motivated to, to make change. My name's Marion McConnell. Um, I'm a member of the Uniting Church in Australia, have been for many, many years, almost all my life, since its inception at least. And I'm also um, a founding mem member of a group that started in the ACT back in 1995 called Families and Friends for Drug Law Reform. Tonight I'm both excited because of the crowd that are here tonight, much more than what we got um, 25 years or more ago when we started this movement of Families and Friends for Drug Law Reform. But I'm so frustrated because not a lot has happened. I mean, some things have happened and we're talking more about it and we're hearing this wonderful story from Manuel tonight where over in Portugal we treat, they treat all people as human beings, as people. And yet, after all these years of telling my story, of all other members of Families and Friends for Drug Law Reform telling their stories, and we're told here tonight by a politician that stories make a difference, they haven't. My story has not made much difference. It has, well, I, hopefully it has brought the Uniting Church here today, perhaps, because I did tell my story. But surely, I mean, politicians, have to move. They have to move on this. We can't keep telling these stories and, and allowing people to die and people going to prison and people with mental health problems in prisons. We can't allow this to continue. Politicians have to start listening harder and have to start understanding the people who, who used drugs, like my son, he was 24 when he died. He had a full-time job. He had a degree. He was a good person, but for some reason, he got caught up in this drugs taking, and I think probably because he was frustrated with the world. The world wasn't what he would have wanted it to be, and he found some solace in taking this flame and drug. And what happened when he overdosed? Police interfered. When, when there were health people there to help him, when we weren't allowed to, to go into where he was, we weren't allowed to speak with him. And the police interfered and frightened him away from health. Now, this was 1992, for heaven's sake. Where are our politicians? We must have change. But I just want to say tonight, it is wonderful, absolutely wonderful, to see so many people here and to see them in a church and that our church, the Uniting Church, cares about people and sees that people is the main thing. Can I just say, Marianne, Marianne, your story does make a difference. That applause tells you. We've got time for just one more question tonight. G'day. I'm Bill Cruz, and I went to my first public drug awareness meeting with Reverend Ted Noss in 1971. I went, I was a member of the, the drug reform group that met at Parliament House to in 1992, I think it was, 1993, we had all these proposals and we we're going to do all this stuff and it was all rushed up to Bob Carr and he said, oh, we can't do all that. Um, we'll have to slow it down. Um, the truth is, in all this time, even in 1971, we knew what to do. We knew. We knew in 1993 what to do. We knew. We knew. We know what to do. The evidence is there everywhere. It's... It's there. I agree with what Marion said. It's not, you don't, you can't convince people you have to do it. And the way you do it is you believe in yourself, what you do, and you go out and do it and make change. It's not going to change by us trying to con up politicians to do it. It's going to change when we grab them by the arms and make them do it. It's the only way. 
uh, otherwise there would be 50 years down the track saying the same things. Because somehow, like the gay, the whole gay marriage thing was proof of that, that unless you do it, like the people who hold it back are a minority. They're a minority. Most people agree with us that we've got to do something and want something done. What we do is we respect the minority too much in this regard. And you, you, the way you change attitudes is by changing behaviour. You'll never change behaviour by trying to change people's attitudes. You have to change the behaviour first. So as soon as we start acting like it's going to happen, it will happen. And I think what holds us back is our own feelings that we've got to suck up to all these people who are supposed to know things because they know better. And what we've got to do is change them. And the only way we change it is by changing our behaviour, which will change their attitudes. Thanks. Thank you for the questions for not tonight and thanks for being here and in fact for more of the thanking I'm going to hand over to Caitlin Scott also representing uniting, the Uniting Church um, to, to thank our guests and to wrap up the evening. I will just say and just give me a sec once she's finished there's snacks and stuff downstairs I'll tell you more about that in a second. Thanks Will. We just wanted to um, thank Manuel for his generosity and fortitude. Um, with being with us tonight um, and in, for his invitation to Portugal uh, to imagine a different way of being in community. Um, also, thank you to Jeff for his time and for sharing his experience um, and uh, to Marianne, affectionately known as MJ. Um, when I started as a chaplain in Uniting, I took a tour of MSIC and I came out the other side and I, was, and I said to uh, um, MJ, this is totally where Jesus would hang out. And um, I, I still feel that really strongly and appreciate her work. I think that we all have been encouraged um, to hear of the work you all have done um, and have accomplished through openness um, to the untried um, and compassionate pragmatism and collaborative action. Um, also, thank you for um, St. Stephen's and your welcome to us, Ken. Um, for me, the Uniting Church um, has been and continues to be a place where all people are welcome to come and to have challenging conversations, um, to have conversations that shine a light into the shadow places um, and ask us to truly see ourselves and to see other people. Um, and in that seeing, hopefully, to, to give it some loving attention. Um, I think without further ado, we should give some presents. Um, Will, would you just mind? <laughs> There are two boxes of chocolates, one for Emmanuel and um, Jeff, speaking of addictions. And um, we'd also love, Marianne, for you to have these lovely flowers. Um, thank you to all of you for coming tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Thanks, Caitlin, and thank you all so much for coming tonight. It's been a real, really incredible moment in the movement. If you would like to come downstairs and um, have a snack, Uniting have been kind enough to put that on downstairs. There's an amazing hall right under this room. Thanks for coming tonight.